Uh, yeah, I just thought I would um, uh, do a quick whiz through some of Mescaline's many lives to start off with, just so that uh, we get a sense of the scope of the story. And um, this is probably still the most famous of Mescaline's um, incarnations, uh, Aldous Huxley, um, his first Mescaline trip, which he wrote up in Doors of Perception in 1954, after which he and Humphrey Osmond, the uh, a psychiatrist who provided the mescaline, uh, batted around some correspondence and came up with a coin the term psychedelic to describe it. At this point, psychedelic described basically LSD and mescaline. Uh, psilocybin and DMT hadn't been synthesized at this point. And um, so uh, of those two, LSD was the one that had been recently synthesized in the laboratory. Mescaline at this point already had a long and rich and complex history. So that's the sense in which I refer to it as the first psychedelic. In fact, its history was longer and richer than Huxley appreciated. Huxley talks a bit uh, about um, uh, peyote and its traditional use in Mexico and its use by the Native American church. But at that time, it was not yet established that the San Pedro cactus uh, contained mescaline. It was also not yet established that uh, this um, carving of a San Pedro from the Chavin temple site in the Andes was 3,000 years old, and that there was a continuous history of San Pedro use from then to the present day. In fact, at that time, San Pedro shamanism was not really very widely known about at all. Of course, during uh, the uh, last generation, it's globalized. This was the form in which Europeans first encountered mescaline, uh, peyote, um, it, during the Spanish conquest in the 16th century. Um, as Thomas said, there's a lot of uh, observations and reports in early Spanish sources about um, peyote, and it also uh, became uh, the first drug to be prohibited when uh, the Mexican Inquisition banned it in 1620. But uh, despite that, uh, its traditional use in Mexico continued, particularly in the northern desert areas where it was native, and it continues today, uh, most famously among the Huichol, who uh, represent it uh, uh, commonly in their, in their art. During the 19th century, uh, peyote was adopted by the uh, Southern Plains tribes of the United States, uh, this was during their period of forced captivity on the reservations, uh, when their traditional ceremonies were banned uh, by the missionaries on the reservations and by the federal authorities, and um, singing and dancing were prohibited. Uh, so the peyote ritual uh, evolved kind of within a teepee at night as a sort of clandestine form of worship. Um, there, I tell this story through a couple of different perspectives. Uh, one of them is Quana Parker, the chief of the Comanches, second from the left in the front row here, who was an early adopter of the uh, uh, peyote religion and kind of one of its great advocates and champions who spread it through the southern plains. The other perspective is the man behind the camera here, who was James Mooney, who was uh, an ethnologist at the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, he was the first white man to attend a peyote ceremony and uh, he carried on and became a great advocate for the peyote religion 25 years after this photo was taken. He was instrumental in forming and incorporating the Native American church. This is 1893. Uh, this is the morning after an all-night peyote ceremony. This is in Oklahoma. Those are the Wichita Mountains. And right after this photo was taken, uh, Quana Parker gave a big sack of dried peyote buttons to James Mooney. Mooney took them back to Washington, D.C., where they were used in the first scientific trials and um, then distributed on to people like William James. So this photo captures that moment of uh, transmission uh, you know, from indigenous culture to Western science. This was, this was the day. This is another important moment of, tran of transition that happened exactly 100 years ago in 1919. Mescaline was synthesized in the uh, laboratory for the first time. And in 1920, it was made available as a research chemical by Merck Pharmaceuticals. Uh, 
and throughout the 1920s, mescaline was used widely in scientific experiments by psychologists and psychiatrists. There are dozens of trip reports and uh, descriptions of subjective experiences. After a while, um, psychologists started giving it to artists and writers and thinkers and philosophers to try and get their perspectives on it. Uh, this is probably the first work of art um, by a Western artist on a major psychedelic. Uh, this is 1929, Stanislaw Witkiewicz, who was a Polish avant-gardist. You can just see at the bottom the Mesk Merck. He, um, whenever he did a portrait on drugs, he always kind of signed the drug along with his own name. So, you know, decades before the 60s, there was very, very fertile um, sort of contacts between psychedelic science and art and uh, philosophy and ethnobotany. Um, mescaline then, by the 1950s, was being very heavily used in psychiatry, particularly in research into schizophrenia. That, of course, is the context in which uh, Aldous Huxley first encountered it. But already by that time, it was starting to be replaced by LSD, basically because LSD was so much more potent. So um, a gram of mescaline is about three doses. A gram of LSD is thousands of doses. So LSD became the research chemical of choice. And then in the 1960s, when the psychedelic counterculture emerged, Naturally, for the same reason, underground chemists all graduated, uh, you know, gravitated towards LSD. And mescaline became, for most people, a kind of a legendary substance. Um, you know, it was remembered, but, uh, you know, it wasn't around very much. The great cultural references of uh, that period are these two. On the one hand, uh, Castaneda and his um, initiation through a series of uh, peyote trips into the world of the Nahual, or shaman, and uh, on the other hand, uh, Hunter S. Thompson, so about halfway through Fear and Loathing when he really wants to kind of ramp up the psychedelic craziness to the maximum, he deploys mescaline for that, and I think that's partly because at that point it was something everybody would have heard of, but very few people uh, would have taken. But the most important mescaline trip of the 60s with hindsight was uh, Alexander Shulgin's this was Shulgin's first trip, and he said, you know, it totally confirmed him in the course of his life's work, which was to try and find uh, mescaline analogues and uh, to work his way through synthesis of new phenethylamines. Uh, it was a quest that, of course, led to MDMA and 2CB and all the dozens of other phenethylamines that he uh, knew and loved. And um, so I think... Um, even though mescaline as a pure chemical substance has virtually disappeared, both from scientific research and from psychedelic culture, uh, its indirect influence on psychedelic culture has been enormous. And of course, the mescaline containing cacti are being used today far more widely than they ever have been before. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things like uh, with mescaline is kind of like emerges out of this kind of prehistory, um, where it's just this kind of kind of small dose of archaeological evidence. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what that evidence is and maybe give it some context as well? What, what do we know about Shabin, for example? Yeah, I think uh, Thomas was just talking about um, you know contextual evidence and uh, you know in terms of sort of Mexican mushroom use. I think, um, you know, Chavin is fascinating because you have so many different strands of evidence that you don't really have. And uh, I mean, you can, you, as a su supposition, you can insert psychedelics into almost any prehistoric culture, you know, and who's to say that they weren't there. You know, what's interesting about Chavin is, as well as having this really obvious um, uh, carving of a San Pedro cactus being held by a sort of shape-shifting figure, he's kind of transformed. There's a lot of there's a lot of heads and figures at Chavin which are transforming from humans into other uh, animals, you know, growing fangs. And particularly, they have kind of great gouts of snot coming out of their noses. And as well as the um, San Pedro cactus, um, there's lots of finds for the Chavin culture of um, uh, snuff trays and um, bone snuffing tubes, which are still used, you know, for snuffing mostly anadenanthera, you know, yopo, yop uh, so DMT. Uh, so there's 
so there's all that, um, you know, sort of uh, physical archaeological evidence, and there's the artistic representation, and then there's also all around it the continuing traditions of uh, San Pedro and, and Adenanthra use. So, um, you know, I think, I was, and, the, and you see that the, you know, the mainstream professional archaeologists writing about Chavin all say, you know, presumably psychoactive plants were a part of whatever ceremony carried on here. I mean, they don't spec none of them speculate in very interesting ways about what that would have been, but nobody kind of uh, debates whether it was there. And I've got my own theories from having visited it and looked at the architecture of the space, which appears to be constructed very theatrically for some kind of, you know, ceremony to happen within it, and you can see you know, where might have been a kind of uh, good space for a kind of um, a, a sort of large group ceremony that could have involved a sort of uh, San Pedro brew and where might have been a more private little underground cubicles for your DMT bit. But so that supposition... Space as well? Or was it, does it seem just like a ritual space? There's this kind of big gate with... Um, uh, all these kind of shape-shifting, transforming head sculptures around it. And then there's a passageway through to that, to a big kind of sunken courtyard that looks like where you'd have kind of a mass gathering, you know. And, um, you know, then there's this kind of whole network of underground subterranean chambers, you know, which look more like the kind of dream incubation spaces, more kind of individual. So, you know... Given that, you can kind of start to map out your idea of what the ceremony might have been like and, you know, w which psychedelics might have been involved where. I mean, that remains speculation, but, you know, I think there's, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a really interesting basis, you know, to, to, to work from. Do you think that people are going to be trying it out sometime soon? Uh, I think, um, I mean, I've already uh, been invited to ceremonies there. The, um, uh, so I, I suspect um, it's, some people have already had a go. Uh, the guy who um, ran the site was, um, you know, when I was there, was pretty like, you know, if you guys want to come back at night for a bit of a ritual or something, that's fine, the gate's open, you know. <laughs> but I think in terms of the sort of combination of phenethylamines and tryptamines, you know, which is something that, you know, it seems only to have been discovered, you know, quite recently in psychedelic culture. I think, um, you know, the evidence that Chavine gives a really solid basis for that having been worked, you know, in prehistoric pre contexts. Well, it's amazing that so much from that space has been thrown up, because I suppose if you um, excavated a medieval English village, it's very unlikely you'd find such a wealth of um, plant ritual items, I wonder... Yeah, that's right. I mean, you're, ne you're never going to be able to, um, you know, find any archaeological remnants of um, rituals or ceremonies. So you're never going to be able to get to the point of knowing what those plants meant to those people. Um, so the other thing I really loved about the book, and I, and I thought just like played off beautifully, is this kind of shift in territories uh, that kind of developed in the 19th century between the Native American use and then when the first scientists get hold of it, and they seem to have a very kind of particular view about how it should be used um, uh, and for what purposes. I wonder if you can talk about the contrast between those two approaches and how they kind of emerge. Yeah, I mean, that was really interesting um, challenge in the writing, you know, because you've got two different histories, really. You know, you've got the history, uh, you know, the Western history, which starts kind of in the 1890s, you know, with a bang, with some amazing, some of the most best psychedelic um, subjective reportage ever written, I think, you know, and then kind of uh, goes through all these various territories in the modern era. But before that, you've got hundreds and thousands of years of indigenous tradition. And the material that you have to work with to write these two different type of histories is very different. Um, in terms of modern Western use, it's incredibly rich in subjective trip reports. And... Um, you know, they're all very, very focused on separating out the effects of the mescaline from anything else that may be going on. And they get very, very preoccupied from a very early stage of the early ones with the, the visuals. You know, it's all, you know, 8.52, you know, take sort of uh, four peyote buttons, 9.23s, I'm starting to notice violent and gr green traces around my, you know, notepad. You know, that's kind of, you know, and, and that's been the default setting. You know, you've gone to Erewid now, there's tens of thousands of reports like this, you know, and uh, um, then when you go back to look at indigenous use, there basically are none. People don't write that kind of report. People don't um, kind of individualize their experience in that way and people also don't prioritize the visual in the same way in fact there's quite 
um, you know, an assumption in a lot of um, traditions, Native American and, um, you know, Wichol, that, you know, if you're, if you're getting hooked up on the sort of, vis on the psychedelic visuals, you're being distracted, you know, it's all too easy on mescaline just to close your eyes and have these lovely kaleidoscope patterns, but then you're missing the main thing that's going on, you know, and... Uh, so I think, you know, writing the indigenous history, it's much less about the individual experience. It's much more embedded in the culture. You know, from that perspective, you know, there's something weird about our insistence on pulling the psychedelic bit out of the culture and investigating it on its own. You know, and so you get a different, you know, you have really kind of powerful sweeping narratives, but they're stories of a whole people, by and large, rather than individuals. You know, that's why it's interesting when you get someone like Kwana Parker, who was kind of forced to be an individual because, I mean, he was the chief of the Comanches, but there had never been a chief of the Comanches before the white man. You know, that was just because uh, the Comanches at that point had to have one person to sort of front up to the white world, you know, which he did amazingly well. So, you know, it's only kind of really, in, and, you know, the only kind of real first person descriptions you get are when people are interviewed by anthropologists. So you get a sense that, you know, that kind of thing that, um, you know, the sort of Western account of psychedelics is, um, you know, which is about the individual, is something that, um, you know, has always been regarded as a bit crude and reductive in indigenous cultures. So the materials that you have to tell that story are completely different. And, and so you had some first-hand experience of a Native American church ceremony, was it? I did, yeah. Um, uh, hands up here, who's read the book? Yeah, yeah. I'd say, my, my favourite, none of my favourite. No, maybe my favourite chapter is the very last one, which is a, um, a description of that experience, but um, it's written in the third person, which is quite unusual. I was wondering why you chose to do that. Yeah, I mean, earlier in the book, um, I do, you know, the conventional thing and write my sort of first person trip report about a San Pedro experience in Peru several years ago. You know, partly because I think at that point, you know, Readers are always, I mean, I know when I'm reading a book about drugs, I'm always kind of wondering whether the author actually, has, you know, knows what they're talking about. So, and also it's kind of quite, it's quite good to put it in there because uh, that's a point where there aren't, we haven't had a lot of first person reports by that point. And so I vaguely assumed when I was writing the book that, um, you know, I would reprise that at the end uh, when it, doing it, uh, a, a peyote meeting in Oklahoma with this Comanche group of um, Kwana's lineage which was just awesome. They got up when, um, when Kwana died in 1911. He had what's called a grandfather peyote. Lots of roadmen have like a really special peyote. And Kwana's peyote sat in this beautiful little wooden glass box. And it was on his bedside when he died. And they um, got it out for the first time ever. It like sat on the altar at a ceremony. So it was just unbelievable. It was just awesome to be there. But then kind of writing in that style of like, here I am at this peyote ceremony and, you know, then putting myself in the sort of centre of that, in the foreground, and then I'd be, you know, relegating to the background basically all the interesting stuff that I'd come all the way to see. That kind of felt wrong at that point, so I ended up um, writing that as a third-person experience, basically writing it as a collective experience rather than as an individual one. Yeah, um, and it works brilliantly. So oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so let's throw it out to the floor. Anyone got any questions? Oh, yeah. Danny? Yeah, well, I'm interested in um, what you've read and what you've seen from, 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 from that culture on sharing your visions. Uh, yeah, there is... Um, or not, or keeping quiet about The... Um, Barbara Meyerhoff in the peyote hunt, where she interviews uh, Ramon Medina Silva, the uh, uh, Wichol Maracame, who uh, arguably um, Castaneda based um, Don Juan on to an extent. Um, he kind of says in, in the course of that that, um, you know, why, you know, why would you want to? You know, these are the, these are kind of the, you know, these are the sort of private personal gifts to you. You know, why would you want to share them? What would be your motive for doing that? You know, why would you want to kind of impose your visions on other people? And, um, you know, so I think it's starting from, a, starting from a different position. You know, I mean, if you're, you know, as, as Westerners, we're individuals. You know, if we're scientists, we're looking to contribute to science. You know, we've got a motive for sharing our experience and personalising it. But I think um, in those cultures, 
there's a, there, you know, there, you know, there, there are motives for not doing that. For you know, that that's the, something that's kind of like private and deep and enriches you, and it's not going to mean the same thing to anybody else as it is to you. And it would be a bit uncomfortable if other people started sharing their visions with you. It's like, you know, keep it. So, if I may ask, uh, so personally, having looked at both of these perspectives, what do you choose to do? Uh, well, I kind of. Um, I kind of made both diff different choices in different contexts. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, yeah we just a dose question here. I, I've taken San Pedro before a sweat lodge, but on a really small glass. But I've heard so many like, conflicting amounts, like the powder. You know, someone says to me, oh, there are four tablespoons. Like, I'm talking about high dose. Would you be able to just? Yeah, um, San Pedro potency, you know, probably, you know, not much more than 1%, 1.5% maybe of dried weight. Um, mescaline, um, three to 400 milligrams is a fairly um, solid dose. So you'd want to work it out from there. But I have found it very imponderable in the past. You know, I have done elaborate preparations, you know, fermenting things down over days and kind of not got much. And I've just sliced up some San Pedro and chucked it in a pot and um, drank it and had kind of really overwhelming experiences. So I have, I've never got to, it's, it's always a surprise, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, any questions on this side? Uh, I wondered, go on, Rob. Rob. If you had one inspiring event earlier on in your career that set you off on the path, like that. Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I had a single ep epiphany, but it's been decades that I've been um, taking psychedelics and um, uh, I've, uh, you, know, I've, you know, I've just continued to find them fascinating and enriching and uh, I intend to continue to continue. Yeah, mescaline and the existentialists. It's it's a funny one because um, you know a lot of the first sort of peyote and mescaline reports really are you know pure phenomenology. You know they're just um, you know uh, you know people are just um, you know it's stream of consciousness stuff. This is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm experiencing. Um, you know it's very much what the sort of phenomena phenomenologists were calling for, and I think that's why Sartre was interested and uh, he had a friend, childhood friend, who was a psychiatrist who gave him some mescaline. We don't learn much from Sartre himself about what he got out of uh, mescaline. He didn't write very much about it. I mean, what we, what, what's best known is Simon de Beauvoir's thing about him being followed around by crabs and freaked out. There are times when Sartre says, actually, that mescaline experience was really, you know, I think I had a bit of a nervous breakdown after that. But then when he was interviewed, like, you know, sort of in, in, the, in the 70s, much, much later, he goes, oh, mescaline, yeah, that was great. Um, I think, you, uh, the, the, you know, the, the most interesting um, contribution uh, is from Merleau-Ponty in the Phenomenology of Perception, uh, where I think he uses, a, I think, probably a lower dose of um, mescaline than Sartre had. You know, Sartre obviously had kind of Took, took, took it to a point where just everything became really uncomfortable and unpleasant. And you've only got to read a bit of, bit of nausea, you know, to get a sense of uh, what it was like to Sartre. But uh, Merleau Ponty says, you know, uh, psychedelics are really interesting for phenomenology and for philosophy in general because, um, you know, they kind of they give us things that we know aren't being shared by other people. And also, you know, we know that our senses are lying to us. So they kind of rupture the usual scientific story about, oh, you know, sort of stimulus and sensation produces consciousness. They remind us that our, um, uh, 
you know, our consciousness is not something that's just produced automatically by stimuli. It's something that's embodied, you know, something that we're getting through the senses. It's also something that's social. You know, there's a difference between uh, something that you know is only happening to you and something that you know is happening to everybody. So I think there is quite a lot of um, juice for the existentialists to squeeze out of masculine. Yeah. Uh, right at the back. Yeah. Um, outside of the traditional context, do you see for mescaline some special use, for example, in therapy uh, that the currently used psychedelics do not provide? Is there a special um, something that mescaline does that the other others don't do, or something like that's um, special to mescaline? I think we've, um, because of the way that we um, try and instrumentalize these substances. Um, I think as well as the dosage issue, um, LSD was kind of um, preferred by sort of scientists in the 50s and 60s to mescaline because mescaline is very unpredictable. It has a lot of different effects. It has a lot of adrenergic, somatic, physical effects as well as its kind of visual effects. And, um, you know, once Shulgin got to work on, you know, I, th I think, you know, things like MDMA and... 2CB, in a way, you can see them as um, sort of, uh, you know, mescaline tamed for the chemical generation. You know, this only lasts three or four hours. It's not 12 hours. It's not so grueling. You know, it's not so trippy, you know, but also it's not so challenging. You know, so in a way, I think mescaline has been designed out of, um, you know, uh, sort of the psychedelic renaissance by, um, you know, people producing... Um, you know, analogues to it that are more effective for one purpose or another. But I think um, in terms of its traditional healing, um, it's rather than trying to instrumentalise it for a particular pur purpose, I think things like the Native American church ceremony have basically taken peyote for what it is, you know, seen it as a personality, you know, with many different characteristics and attributes and built something around it that works fantastically well. Brilliant. Uh, we've got time for one more question. I just wonder if you were looking at the amount of records. So, given that the MDMA is their patent, mescaline is their patent, it strikes me that Afton Hosted oh, okay. is doing proto PCAL work. And it's, 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 it's essentially going down the same line of investigation that Sasha did. So, what else is in their records? Sorry, else? could you give, the, give us the beginning of that again? Given that you looked at the Merck records. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yep. This is Merck Pharmaceuticals, who, um, as well as marketing mescaline as a research chemical in 1920, they also patented MDMA in 1912. So they must have been doing some sort of similar to what Sasha started later. Is there anything else that, that in that archive that we've kind of missed? That's a really good question. I mean, it was all, you know, German pharmacology was what drove all this, you know, from the isolation of morphine from opium, you know, through sort of caffeine and then cocaine. And it was kind of during their early work with amphetamines that uh, um, MDMA was patented, but not as far as we know used. And, um, yeah, uh, I mean, the work on... Uh, uh, the synthesis of mescaline was done by Ernst Spät at Vienna University. Uh, and after that, he worked through, um, you know, he produced ephedrine, I think, I was saying, quite a lot of the other um, alkaloids in the cactus. He was sort of working his way through that. Um, but as far as I know, Merck didn't go down um, Sasha's route because when he, when Shulgin started, you know, he was surprised at how few synthetic analogues of mescaline had been developed. Um, Mike, thank you very much. Oh, pleasure.